Good morning, Church. I bring greetings to you all in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I also bring greetings to you all from my loved ones back home. Indeed, it's a joy for me to stand here. I'm very much honored to share the love of God this morning. Once a photographer for a national magazine was assigned to take a picture of a great forest fire smoke at a scene. Hampered him, the smoke at the scene hampered him and asked his home officer to hire a plant. Arrangements were done and he was told to go once by a nearby, nearby airport where the plant will be waiting. When he arrived at the airport, a plane was warming up nearby the airway, runway. And so he jumped in with his equipment and yelled, let's go, let's go. The pilot swung, swung the plane into the wind and they were soon in the air. Fly over to the north side of the fire, yelled the uh, photographer, and make three or four levels passes. To this, the pilot asked, why, why do you want me to do that? And the photographer replied, because I'm going to take the pictures. You know, I'm a photographer and photographers, they take pictures. After a pause, the pilot said, you mean you are not an instructor? Which means the pilot, he himself is not an expert. He needed someone who can lead him. He needed someone who can guide him. On the other hand, the pilot, the photographer needs an expert pilot who can lead, me, lead him in any way so that he can take a clean picture. After all, he wants a picture for a national magazine. And that is exactly how the way of our life appears to us at times. It seems like at times, whoever may be driving, the plane does not know where he or she is going or what he or she is doing. From our vintage point, it seems that our lives get into more messes than we can figure out. According to the Bible, the children of God are perpetually victorious people. We can always see it, we don't always feel it, and we don't always live like it. However, it's true nonetheless. We may feel like, we may not feel like the conqueror today. We might feel like an inexperienced pilot who is at the yoke of his life, regardless of who, regardless of who, this, It's okay. Tell me what's going on with me. Okay. Regardless of how we feel, 
this morning the verses that we are going to look into Like we might feel like an inexperienced pilot who is at a yoke of his life. Regardless of how we feel, this verse offers words of encouragement. The words of hope, peace, and encouragement to those who feel discouraged, rejected, defeated, and overwhelmed by those Sorry. Okay, so let's take a fresh look at this familiar verse in Romans chapter 8, verses 35 to 39 on the topic, more than conquerors. And how can a person be, when we talk about more than a conqueror, how can a person be more than a conqueror? I wonder after conquering, what more else will be there? What else is there? To conquer is a victorious over an adversary, but to be more than a conqueror means with, on, with not only achieve victory, but we are overwhelmingly victorious. To the W. B. J. Martins described, he said, "Head can make a man a, a conqueror, can fill him with furious energy. Only when head can make him more than a conqueror. When we look at the book of Romans, the book of Romans was written by Apost Apostle Paul. He wrote this letter from, from the city of Corinth, short after he wrote the second Co Corinthians, and it was believed to be recorded in the spring of 1856. And this letter was written to the Christians who were residing in the city of Rome. Rome was the center of the empire and was ethnically diverse. Rome was ethnically diverse and it was also predominantly populated by Gentiles. And so it is expected that the church was compromised, comprised of both Jewish and Gentile believers and Paul addressed by both the community in chapter 1, verse 7. We see here, to all God's beloved in Rome, who are called to be the saints. The early Jewish Christians in Rome were exposed to, de expo exposed to terrible forms of torture, death, imprisonment, physical violence, and brutal deaths. They faced many trials and uh, sufferings. They were exposed to they were persecuted and opposed because of the faith in Jesus Christ, and many of them were in diaspora. However, they were also said to be the most receptive to the me message of the gospel since they did not have the hostile predispositions of the Jews. They were also convinced that the polytheism, which was, famous, which was a famous religion at the time, was false. 
And Paul wrote this letter mostly to the Gentile audience. His main concern in writing this letter was to educate the believers of the Gentiles. And in the basic doctrines, uh, in, he he, his main concern in writing this letter was to deliver it in the basic doctrines that is related to salvation. Now, the book of Romans in chapter 8, verses 35 to, 35 to 39, it reads, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardships and distress or persecutions or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, and not only that, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Keeping the context that I have shared in mind, let us look in the verse of chapter t verse 35, where we see Paul uses several questions. He asks, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us? And then he continued to list on seven different obstacles that we face at one time or another, in one way or another. He says, shall trouble or hardships or persecutions or famine or nakedness or sword. Although this was asked 2,000 years back today, nothing, has, nothing much has changed, you know, because we are facing these same problems today. We are facing troubles, hardships, persecutions, and fam famine in every day, in every walks of our life, you know. What are these problems then that we are facing today, church? What can you think of these problems? Are these problems a peer pressure from our family members or our friends because of our faith, because of our acceptance of Christ? Or is it the broken relationship of family, the broken relationship of your loved and dear ones? Or is it rejections, addictions, or identity crisis, confusion about your faith in Christ Jesus? Or losing our dear ones? Or is it the financial problems or the financial crisis that we face every day in every walks of our life? Most of these questions we Christians and we children of God, we ask questions to God over this with lots of why. We ask questions with lots of why. And this is true because when we are overwhelmed by sufferings like this, we tend to doubt God. We feel separated. We feel that we are separated from his love for some unknown reasons which we can't think about. But after all these questions, Paul gave an absolute no. In, in, verse, in verse 37, the word no here we, says, we see, Paul is introducing something contrary to all that might have been expected. What is that expectation? It's obvious we might be thinking that, or we might have thought when we faced those problems. For instance, we might have thought for a while that God never God never answers our prayers, and I think it's true. When I say we doubted God, or we ask God, or we think, or we have thought that God never answers our prayers, I think all of you will agree with me. We, we, when we face sufferings, when we face troubles, when we face persecutions, we ask God, why is it me? Or why it always happens to me? Or where are you? Are you really there for me, why not you answer my prayers? And these are some questions, these things we tend to ask God, but Paul directing the early believers with, absolutely, with absolute no. And that no of Paul is directing to us to today. He says, no way. You are wrong if you think that way. Believers, 
you are wrong if you think that way because no situations that you are in today can change the truth of love of God that is in us. The truth of love, the truth of God's love for you and I can never be changed. In all these things, Paul continued to, stay, continued to say, we are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors. When he says in all these things, Paul is not overlooking even a single thing. He is being careful with all these things. And when he say in all these things, Paul carefully brought out everything in the midst of tribulation, distress, and persecutions. Because as said in the introduction, the early believers, the early Christians in Rome faced lots of persecutions, especially under the reign of Emperor Nero. Emperor Nero uses Christianity as the scapegoat for the great fire of Rome in AD 67, in AD 64. In order to divert his failings, his, he pointed his hand towards the Christianity because of the big fire. And that is how the first persecution, the most first persecution of the, start, of the church begins. And because it is said that Emperor Nero wasted no time, but he immediately arrested and tortured all the Christians in Rome. Because, because, as said, he hated Christianity. And before executing the Christianity, he, exec he, he tortured them. He tortured them. And this Christianity, these early believers were crucified. Some were thrown into wild, to wild animals. And some were burned alive as a living torches. Imagine how painful the how how painful these early believers went through. How serious sufferings that they went through. When when the believers were going through these persecutions, take note of all, of what Paul did not say. In this, Paul did not say two things that we see is. He, did, he never said, Paul never said, in some of these difficulties. Paul never said, in some of these difficulties, God will help you overcome. But what Paul says is that in all these things, no matter what, whether it's big or small, whether it's, it's uh, good or bad, in all these things, God will help you overcome it. The second thing that we don't see is that Paul never say, Paul never say, God will remove God will remove all these things. But what we see here is God will help you. God will fight along with you. God will go along with you and help you overcome all these difficulties. When, we, when, we, when I say that Paul never said these two things, I mean to say that God, he himself will be with us. God, he himself will fight along with us. In fact, Paul was speaking from his own experiences. He was imprisoned, he was flogged, he was beaten, and he was persecuted. There, was, there were times when Paul had to go without food for days. And he also faced all kinds of dangers. And I should say, Paul faced the worst treatment of his life, of any human's life. Yet, the amazing thing that we see is Paul was not defeated. He never says, I am tired. Or he never says, or he never questioned God. Church, have any one of you see in the Bible that where Paul questioned God because of his sufferings? I don't think so. Paul never questioned God. Paul never complained to God. Yet he continued to say, rejoice. How is it possible practically in our life? I don't think it's possible. But Paul continued to say rejoice, and he also said, the sufferings that Christ suffered for us on the cross can nothing be compared to the sufferings that we are facing today. The sufferings that we are facing today, it's nothing compared to the sufferings of Christ. And he continues to say, we need not be defeated. We should not be defeated by those situations, by those persecutions, by those sufferings that we are facing today. But we should be more than conquerors. We should be more than conquerors because in verse 37, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
we are more than conquerors if we have Christ in us. If we have the love of God in us, nothing can defeat us. We are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors not only over the sin, not only over Satan, but the world, the afflictions, the accusations, and the persecutions that comes your way, that comes our way, which the early believers cheerfully and courageously underwent. The early believers have not only overcome, but they have exceedingly win over it. They exceedingly win over this soft, those sufferings, for they not only patiently bear the afflictions and persecutions, but you know, they glory in them, they rejoice in them, and their experience, their faith, and joy are often increased by them over Satan and his hellish emissaries. And which was possible through Christ Jesus our Lord who saved us, through him who has got victory over all his peoples and his people's enemy. Christ have conquered death. And because of his love, today we are more than conquerors. Then who can separate us from the love of Christ? Who can separate us from the love of God? In verses 38 and 39, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. Paul has taken us up the mountain to see the view. The big picture of what had happened. And we have paused at a viewpoint for a couple of verses to reflect on martyrdom. But now on the summit, on the peak, Paul concludes this glorious hymn with a, con with a torrent denials flowing one after another. He says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the past nor the present nor the future nor any powers, and not only that, but neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. To be persuaded or convinced here means to attain certainty on something that is certain. And what is the certain thing that we are pursuing? We are running after salvation. We are pursuing the salvation, the eternal life. We have a lock on love, and nothing can separate us that bond, the bond, the relationship that between the father and the children. Nothing can separate that. You know why? Because that love is maintained by God the Father. It is not maintained by we humans. This love we are talking here is not about the human love, the eros love, or the petos love, but we are talking about the agape love that is in God, which is unendless, which cannot end, which has no ending. And so, nothing can separate this bond because this relationship is maintained by God. His love is solid no matter what life throws at us. His life survives our death, friends. His love survives our death. You can't fall low enough or you can't rise high enough to separate from the love of God or to escape from the love of God. Today, if we look around, Christians in Western countries might have not faced much of this kind of threat. But if we look in other side of the world, there are many Christians throughout the world who faces this kind of persecutions, and they have continued to suffer in this way even today. In the West, however, we see they are slowly and surely moving to times of persecutions. Whatever God said in the Bible is happening. <clears throat> Excuse me. As 
people are compromised. As people are compromised, the holy truth of God with the desires for the earthly desires and forsaking culturally forsaking his righteousness. We are more into the worldly matters. We are more into the worldly desires where we tend to look, forsake the righteousness. The Christian's root of American history are being altered today. Just see carefully. It is being altered where freedoms are being challenged every day. Moral integrity, especially regarding the sacredness of marriage, sex, and human life, is all under siege. Blind apathy is almost obvious, ridicule, and hatred are growing every day for Christ and for those who bear his name. And that is what exactly Christ has foretold us in Luke chapter 21, verse 17. Christ has already forewarned us in Luke chapter 21, verse 17, when he says, You will be had. The world will hate you. Everyone will hate you for my name. Because, because of me, people will hate you. Because you bear my name, people will forsake you. Yes, in this life, we suffer. In this life, we face troubles. We face hardships, afflictions, even persecutions and threat of death, as I have said, and I keep on saying this. But even in these things, we overwhelmingly conquer. One of the most moving scenes that regarded in early Christian literature is the martyrdom of Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna. This, the true, the fact, this fact of life really encouraged me and really boosted me up. You know, during a period of persecution, intense persecutions in 155 AD, the venerable saint and the leader of the church in the town of Smyrna, he was an elderly man. He was dragged, hauled before the Roman magistrate. And the reason was because he insisted to deny Christ. When he was forced to do that, he, did, he denied, to, he, denied he, he did not deny Christ, but when he said he stayed strong in his belief, he was, he was treated with death of, he was treated with death by lions, then to be burned alive. But he will not deny Christ. And church historian Isabel recorded that when the magistrates pressed him and said, I God, swear and I will release you, reviled Christ. When he was pressed to say that, you know what Polycarp said? 86 years, I God, 86 years I have been serving him. I have been serving my king. He has done nothing me wrong. Then how can I blaspheme my king? Isn't it amazing? Are you and I really have the strong faith to proclaim that at the threat of death? I think we, we will be confused when we were asked to do that. But this elderly man, he, he, he was not scared of death. And finally, the proconsul sent his herald to proclaim that three times in the midst of the stadium that Polycarp has confessed that he is a Christian and the old man was delivered to the flames. He was burned alive. Now, who do you think conquered here? Who conquered whom? Did the, did the Christ haters actually get the victory by killing this elderly Christian man? No. It can never be. Polycarp overwhelmingly conquered that day as his unshaken testimony rang out across the stadium. It challenged the people, those who were present there. And indeed, even the persecutions and death are not a defeat 
when we have the love of God in us. We are more than conquerors not by avoiding these things. We cannot be called as the modern conquerors by avoiding these things. But we can be modern conquerors by triumphing over them through Christ Jesus. When we go through all these three, when we go through all these things, just remember the three things that Paul reminding us. He is refining our lives. God is refining our lives in first chapter. First Peter chapter 1, verse 7, you will see that. God is refining our lives. The second thing we see is God is remaking our lives. God is remaking our lives. We see that in Romans chapter 8, verse 29. And the third thing that we see is God is realigning our lives. Remember these three things. God is realigning our lives. We see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, verses 7 to 11. The process is painful. The sufferings, the pain of the suffering that we face is a real one and it's not a fake one. It's a real and it's painful. It's painful. But if we are to glorify God in us, if we are to glorify Christ in us, it is necessary that we go through all those sufferings. The truth can be seen in Job and that truth can be seen in us too today. Satan is our adversary. He sends all kinds of life-defeating, joy-stealing, and attacks to threaten the well-being of God's children, and attacks the well-being of children's, God's, our faith in God. Many of those are listed in verses 35 and 39. Troubles, hardships, persecutions, famine, nakedness, and so on. This problem we face, the early Christians faced, we might not be facing exactly what they have faced, but in one way or the other that we face today, we are in no way different from them, but we are facing the same problems. But Paul is encouraging us today. Paul is encouraging us to stand firm in our faith, when those attacks come, when we face those situations, those persecutions, Paul is reminding us that not only we will win in the end, but Jesus will enable us, Christ will enable us to win. So then how is our faith, how strong is our faith in God? My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Satan lacks the power to steal our eternal destiny. And he, can se he cannot separate us from the love of God. Nothing we face worries God in the least. You know why? If we are his children, nothing we face worries God in the least. If we are his children through his son, we, then we have the pledge of God's love and his protection. We have his promise. We have his, his promise of love and protection. We have his promise of eternal life, which we are all looking forward, which we are all looking after, and which we, are, we all are going on for. We have his promise of eternal life and the presence of the Almighty God every moment of every day of our life until we see him face to face. Friends, no sins in our life in the past and no attempt of the enemy can steal us or can steal the loving, the loving care of God from our lives. And that makes us more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loved us. If we are to look into the sufferings, or if we are to look into the attacks, I, I was also the one who was always been, who always faced the kind of troubles, hardships in one way or the other. I always questioned God, but then I realized when I read the scripture, I realized that 
we can never escape by questioning God, or we can never escape by doubting ourselves. But we can be the winner. We can be the winner only if we have the love of God. And so I challenged each and every one of us this morning. Let us all stand together. Let us all keep fighting. And let us all be not just the conquerors, but let us all be more than conquerors. May God bless us all. Amen.